Okay, so we're going to do something different today. Uh, we recently hit 100 subscribers on the YouTube channel. So first of all, thank you if you subscribed. If you haven't already subscribed, please click that button somewhere down there. Uh, it really makes a difference. That's a, a tiny little milestone on, on the journey, but it's, it's nice. It means that at least 100 people in the world find what we're doing valuable. And there's a fair bit of work that goes into these interviews, so really appreciate it. Today, we're going to flip the script. Normally, I'm the one doing the interviewing and I've got a successful founder that I'm asking questions about. Today, we're going to reverse that and I'm gonna be the one being interviewed. So I wanna introduce you to Sonny, who is the Community and Partnerships Manager at Startup Source. She's going to interview me today. Sonny, how are you doing? Good, Ryan, thanks for the intro. And well, actually, welcome to the show. Welcome to your own show, the famous <laughs> Ryan Wardell. So let's kick off with a spicy take. What is your spicy take? Ooh, you know, I'm not going to hold back on this one. Um, my spicy take is I don't think accelerator programs work. I think it's a broken business model, both from the, the point of view of the accelerator program and its investors, and especially the entrepreneurs and the founders that are going into those programs. So, and I'm going to say this, like I am a mentor and I have been a mentor at a, a lot of different startup accelerators around the world. So I am speaking from experience. I know a lot of people that have been through accelerated programs as well. What people say publicly about them and what people say in private are quite different as well. So um, if you look at accelerated programs, and for anyone who doesn't know what that is, like let me just backtrack a little bit. An accelerated program is where typically uh, they take a really early stage startup, they invest, they give them a little bit of money, they give them some office space, they give them some mentoring, usually for about three months. And then at the end of the three months, they put them in a room full of investors and they stick them up on stage and they call it a demo day. And then they go off and they hopefully raise some money and go off and build a, a successful business. Um, now, there's there's probably the three best accelerator programs in the world, uh, Y Combinator, uh, Techstars and 500 Startups. Um, y Combinator is pretty widely regarded as the best of the best. So um, Airbnb came went through Y Combinator, so did Reddit, so did Dropbox, so did uh, DoorDash, Instacart, Stripe. Um, there's a lot of really successful companies that have come through Y Combinator. But if we're talking about Y Combinator as being the, the best of the best, um, they have a, I think they've funded something like 5,000 companies have come through now. Um, they get about, they do multiple batches a year. They get 40 to 50,000 applications per batch and they only take the top one and a half percent. Okay, so Harvard accepts 3%. So getting into Y Combinator is twice as difficult as getting into Harvard University. So that's how selective they are. Now, even though they're that selective, 50% of the companies that have gone through Y Combinator died. Okay, they've got a 50% failure rate. Now you might say, well, okay, hang on, like the normal survival rate, you know, 90% of startups normally die. So if only 50% are dying, that's actually really, really good. Um, but if you're taking the best of the best out of 40 or 50,000 applicants, you're taking the top one and a half percent and half of those fall over, you know, is it actually that successful? You might also say, okay, but they're not really optimizing for survivability. What they're optimizing for is these kind of moonshots. Like they want to build unicorns. They want to build billion dollar businesses. You know, they're not interested in building, you know, profitable, you know, 10, 20, $30 million companies and lots of them. They want to just have swing for the fences and get this all or nothing kind of kind of approach. And that's, that's fine. Um, but the problem with that is that's not necessarily aligned with what most founders want. If you want to build a business and you're a founder of a, a tech company, um, you might want to be, you know, a giant big shot billionaire. Most of us just want to build a really, you know, like a successful company. We want financial freedom that accompanies that. You don't need a billion dollars to be able to do that. And the thing is, because of the, the way their model works, you need to build a company worth you know, at least a billion dollars because you get diluted down to nothing because you've got to raise so many rounds of capital along the way to get there. So just by way of, of comparison, the, the most successful Y Combinator company by far is Airbnb. Um, I think what are they, $60 billion or $80 billion or something. It's a massive company now. Um, so Brian Chesky, the founder of that, he's worth personally about $9 billion. Um, ben Chestnut, who bootstrapped MailChimp and sold it, is worth about $5 billion. Uh, because he owned so much more of his company when it was sold. Um, so anyway, so so the accelerator model from the investor's point of view is swing for the fences. We'll take uh, a chunk of these early stage startups. Who cares if half of them fall over? Um, and, and the value that they provide is you know, office space, a little bit of money, some mentorship connection. If you talk to most of the founders, though, that have been through these programs, 
they'll really tell you that there's there's two value propositions that really stick out. The first one that sticks out is they say it makes it easy to raise capital because they've got a network of investors and you've got the, the rubber stamp of approval. Um, that might be important if you're building a Reddit or an Airbnb or a consumer internet play where you've got to raise a lot of money before you get to a, a point where you're profitable. If you're building a B2B SaaS business though, like the cost of building that, the cost of getting to market has fallen off a cliff. It's it's so much lower now than it used to be. It's cheaper to start and launch a SaaS business than, than it's ever been in human history. Um, and you can monetize it much faster. Like you don't need the capital in a lot of cases. You don't need to go and pay for lots and lots of servers anymore. You can just rent what you need. Um, you know, you don't need to hire a room full of expensive American software engineers. You can offshore that. There are a lot of, you know, there's an army of people that know how to code all over the world that are willing to work for far less money. And there's plenty of tools and resources now that enable you to find them, recruit them and manage them that didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so the value of that capital is a little more questionable. Now, you don't really want to raise capital to figure out what your business is. You want to raise capital just to grow. There's also a lot of um, other revenue, uh, other capital sources that have come along as too, like revenue-based finance for SaaS now is, is a huge thing. Stripe offers, you know, Stripe has Stripe Capital. Um, there is Founder Path. Um, there is there's a whole lot of other revenue-based finance things. So once you've got something working and you can prove that you've got a pretty stable business model, you just want to add some more fuel to the fire. There, are, there, are, you, there is debt capital available um, that you can get fairly easily without having to spend six months going on this big investor roadshow and putting a pitch deck together and all that kind of stuff. You just show them the numbers and you raise the money. The, the value of the capital is not really that good. Um, the other main thing that people point to is the network and the community. Now, the mentors are, are good, but because they take so many people in each batch now, um, and they take such, you know, there's no niche focus. You will have, if you go to Y Combinator's uh, page, and, and I keep talking about Y Combinator because, it is, because it's widely regarded as the best of the best. You know, most other accelerator programs are just glorified PR exercises for you know, big corporates and governments that want to look trendy and innovative and cool. They get very little actual value out of it. Um, so if you go to Y Combinator's website and you look at all their portfolio companies, you will see everything from uh, startups selling underwear to dev tools to, you know, uh, making uh, artificial meat out of insects to all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, now think about that from a mentor's perspective. Okay, if you're the person selling, uh, you know, cool techie underwear, and someone selling tools to developers, those businesses have almost nothing in common. How do you as a mentor give advice to one that is going to be relevant to the other? So it's really difficult to match the mentors up to the individual startups if you're taking such a broad approach. Um, mm -hmm. So even though, yeah, and they end up giving fairly general business advice, which is good, I suppose, especially if you're early on and you don't have a network and you don't really know what you're doing, fine. But like, because they've got such a broad approach, the value of that mentoring is is not so great. Because they have such big batches, you know, you don't get much time with the mentors now anyway. How much value is that really? So what, what most of the founders say is that the real value they get out of uh, Y Combinator or out of any accelerator program are there other batchmates, the other founders that are going through the program with them? Um, and and the, the wider network, you know, all the alumni, all the previous companies have, that have come through that as well. Um, y Combinator has a thing called Bookface, which is which is a pretty funny take on Facebook, uh, which is their community of, you know, current and past um, Y Combinator founders that you get access to and you can reach out to them. And so quite often, uh, if, you know, aside from, you know, Airbnb and some of the earlier companies that, that have been through Y Combinator, most of their success stories uh, B2B SaaS, ironically, and most of those got their start, their initial traction by selling their software to other Y Combinator companies. So, you know, is the value really in the mentoring and the money and the office space and all that and the demo day and everything else? Or is it just, we put you in a room, we give you easier access to a whole bunch of other, you know, smart, successful founders that you can talk to one-on-one. -on -one? Seems like quite a, like an expensive, elaborate way to just get into a community, but, but I just wanted to to ask a quick question. So you said like what Y Combinator does well, what they don't do well. But let's say you were to build an accelerator program that did work. What would that look like? So I think if you you look at the stuff that accelerator programs do well, okay, you've got the community aspect, you've got the alumni aspect, you've got the cycle of people going through, growing their business, and then eventually selling them, and then investing in the next stage, um, and and offering you know mentorship and advice and like paying it paying it back as well. Um, 
that bit is really valuable. That bit works. And especially now in the age of AI and everything else, like there's, um, there is so much content on the internet. You can't necessarily trust that much of it anymore because how much of it is just chat GPT, you know, and chat GPT is, you know, notoriously unreliable in certain circumstances. Um, but what do you do for the things that you can't Google? So uh, quite often, one of the things that we talk about that the people talk about a lot when they go through um, Y Combinator or other uh, accelerator programs is they do these you know, fireside chats or they do these dinners where they get successful founders and they talk about how they really did things. And the rule is you don't talk about that outside of those four walls because quite often they did things that were a little bit unsavory, downright illegal in a lot of cases. Um, so they don't want that to be public knowledge. Um, and, and that that private aspect of learning and sharing how it really is and what we actually did to grow um, that is not the the sanitized version that I will tell to the press, um, that bit's super valuable. So what if you take the community, you take that kind of intimate learning experience that comes with high trust, privacy, and all the rest of it, you take that part out. Um, what if you, you know, the, the money thing like we spoke about, if you need to raise money, sure, we've got a network that we can put you in touch with, but you don't have to raise money. Um, one of the things with with Y Combinator is that they, um, and, and other accelerator programs too, is that there's so much emphasis on raising capital when you're in the program. They're not really focusing much time and attention on helping you build a profitable business. What they're accelerating you towards is not, you know, a, a sustainable business. What they're accelerating you towards is demo day and raising a big round of capital so you can go off and build your company. Um, but that's, you know, so they can get a bigger chunk and their, their investment is actually worth something at that point. So that's what they spend a lot of time and effort and energy accelerating you towards. And that's a massive distraction for a lot of businesses that don't need the capital anyway. If you eliminate that part and, and therefore the requirement to give up, you know, seven to 15% of your business. Um, so you're keeping a big chunk of equity anyway. What if you just had some kind of, you know, sure, these things cost money. So you have some kind of, you know, nominal monthly fee. So it's not expensive and it's accessible to a much wider range of companies, not just ones building these kind of moonshot unicorn things. What if, you know, there, there are a lot more businesses that you could build uh, that are not going to be billion dollar companies. They might be 10, 20, 50, $100 million companies. A $50 million company is still a pretty darn good company. Most people would be happy to sell for $50 million, let alone generate $50 million a year in revenue. Um, if you sell a $50 million company, if you sell a company for $50 million and you own 50% of it, let's say you've got a, you've got a co-founder, you've got 25 million bucks in the bank. That is a life-changing amount of money. You know, you, you, one, you only need to be right once. Um, quite often, even if you go through Y Combinator, unless you're one of the top 1% of that top 1.5%, um, you've got to do it multiple times to, to, to get to that, that realm. Whereas mm -hmm. if you bootstrap it uh, and you build a successful business, you only need to be right once because you own a much, much, much bigger chunk of it. Um, so when we're talking about accelerator programs and the stuff that works and the stuff that doesn't, so the community aspect, that's really valuable. Um, the learning aspect is valuable, but it has to be stuff that you can't Google. There is so much great information available on the internet now for free that didn't exist you know, back in the early 2000s when Y Combinator and the accelerated programs started. Um, a lot of that was still behind closed doors. If you weren't in that, those networks, if you weren't at those dinner tables, you just didn't get access to the knowledge. Now there are so many blogs, there are so many YouTube channels, there are so many successful founders tweeting about this stuff all the time. Like you can, you can absorb a lot just by doing that for free. Um, the, the value in the, the, the mentorship and the information comes from stuff that you can't Google. And that requires community, that requires direct access, that requires an ability to you know, talk to people, ask questions. And it requires a bit of privacy as well because you don't want the sanitized answer, you want the, you know, the actual real answer. What did you do? How do I really do this? Um, so that stuff works. Um, the other thing that's really big in this is um, access to service providers like, and, and employees as well. So as you grow your business, you are going to need to hire people you are going to need to engage external service providers. Um, and a lot of people waste a lot of time and a lot of money on bad hires and shitty service providers. If you were to be a part of this community and it's, you know, cast a much wider net, we're not just taking the top one and a half percent because we're not just going for moonshots. We're going for just to take businesses that are already succeeding a little bit and help them succeed a little bit faster. And we're accelerating them towards revenue rather than raising capital. Take that network. Um, Give them an, uh, the opportunity to network and engage with each other. Give them the opportunity to learn from each other and from, you know, 
external uh, experts as well, and then give them access to a curated list of service providers and a curated list of employees, employees who are more likely to be successful and service providers that are more likely to do a good job um, for a reasonable amount of money. If you can do all of that, you're taking, you're cherry picking the very best parts of joining an accelerator, but you don't have to give up a giant chunk of your company to get that. And you don't have to waste all this time preparing these elaborate, you know, showmanship pitch pitches and all that kind of stuff. You don't have to spend six months out there on the road raising capital from investors. You're, you can just focus on building a kick-ass company. The, this is a giant convoluted way of explaining. That's why we built Startup Source. That's what we're intended to do. So if you're in Silicon Valley or the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area um, just because of the concentration of startups, there is, you know, you go to a barbecue and someone knows someone and they can introduce you to this person. If you're sitting at a cafe, that person over there just raised their round of funding and they can introduce you to this person over here. And like all those informal networks exist um, because of the, the concentration. If you're building particularly a SaaS business outside of the Bay Area, you don't have access to those networks. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the very best parts of an accelerator program and offer that to people who are not in Silicon Valley, who are not necessarily building moonshot unicorns, but still want to build a successful business um, and who want to you know, accelerate towards revenue rather than accelerating towards raising capital. Um, so that's, that's what Startup Source is really about. And if you look at what we've done since then, so we, we started it off as just a, like a networking thing. It was literally meeting up for breakfast, asking questions of, of, of each other. Um, we thought it'd be, you know, us wise old men in our mid thirties and a bunch of kids. And what happened was it's now a bunch of people, you know, mostly forties, fifties and sixties, you know, it's not their first rodeo. They've built and sold businesses before they've got kids, they've got families, they don't go to these startup networking events, but they built really successful businesses that you've probably never heard of, but they spit off multiple millions of dollars a year. Um, so, so what we wanted to do then is like, okay, what if you could put those people in a community? What if you could curate it and keep out all the time wasters, all the tire kickers, all the bad actors, all the people who are just there to, you know, flog their shit and have a genuine community where people engage a lot and help each other. Um, we had, we've had one guy in startup source say that it's the only community he's ever been a part of where he genuinely felt like he could, you know, leave his kids with one of the other members and they'd be okay. You know, there's, that's kind of the level of trust that, 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 that we're dealing with now, which is, which is pretty unique. Um, I think a lot of people, uh, join, want that from a community, but a lot of other communities just don't live up to that expectation. And so that, you know, that. Quite often we talk to people and they're like, yeah, I've been a part of startup communities before. Okay, come and join this one. And like, wow, this is this is different. Like this has a different feel to it. You know, people are engaging, people are helpful. If I ask for advice, a bunch of people will jump in and, and, and help me. Um, and so like, again, that's all the best bits about being in an accelerator program without having to give up, you know, 10 or 15% of your company and waste a lot of time pitching as opposed to just building your business. That's a pretty, pretty solid endorsement, even like from the members to say that. And I agree with you, like the members are awesome. There's a very high level of trust, like more so than I've seen in other communities. But that kind of brings me to my next question, which is why do you think someone would join Startup Source instead of one of the other founder communities out there, apart from the trust? I can give you... What I think, reading between the lines, I can also tell you what other people have, have said about it, point blank, when I've, when I've asked them. Um, the, the biggest problem, I think, is that, you know, we're, humans are social creatures. We want to be around people like us. Um, we want to find our people, find our tribe. And it can be pretty lonely as a SaaS founder um, or any, any sort of entrepreneur, not specifically SaaS. We just focus on SaaS because that's, that's what I know and like. Um, but the... As a founder, as an entrepreneur, it can be very lonely because every day new problems pop up and you don't necessarily know how to deal with them. Where do you go to for advice? You know, it's not like you have a boss who can tell you how to do everything. It's not like you've got a set of, you know, procedures. In most cases, you've got to figure that out on the fly as you're trying to build the rest of your business. And you've got to rewrite and change things constantly as well. So, so I think what a lot of founders are looking for is I want to find other people like me who get what I'm going through, who understand what I'm building, who understand the difficulties and challenges associated with that. Um, and they're one or two steps ahead of where I am right now, because then I'm not the smartest person in the room. I've got an opportunity to learn from, from other people as well, who are not a hundred steps in front of me. Um, you know, like the Alex Hormozzi is awesome. Like love the guy. He's great. He's on YouTube, but, um, you know, 
he's not one or two steps ahead of most people. He's a hundred steps ahead of them. So sometimes his advice is just too advanced for people to be able to actually make use of right now. What, what most people are looking for is, okay, what's, that's great, but what's something I can apply right now in my business tomorrow that is going to help me get from 10 grand a month to 20 grand a month, or is going to take me from, you know, 50 grand a month to, you know, a million dollars a year. Like what, what does that look like? What do I need to do to get there? Um, and that's the bit that's, that's, that's kind of missing. So the, the, to, to answer your question, um, what, why should people join Startup Source as opposed to any other community out there? Um, most other communities fall into one of two buckets. They either turn into a ghost town where there's no activity or engagement. You see that all the time. Or they turn in, they descend into this chaotic free for all where everyone's just, you know, I say flogging their shit. That is my Australian delicate French for um, everyone's just trying to sell their stuff. They treat it as a sales channel. They're not really interested in engaging in a community. They're not interested in helping each other. They just treating it as another, you know, channel that they can spam and get their products and hopefully get a few more sales from it. And that's not a, a nice experience to be a part of. Nobody wants to be pushy sold to all the time. Um, the reason that happens is because there's no like uh, niche focus. So quite often you'll have these communities that are just open to anybody. Um, You've got a SaaS business, fine. You've got an agency, fine. You've got a something else, fine. That's okay. Everyone come in as long as, you know, you pay us some money, you can join this community. And then because there's no commonality, there's there's no filtering, there's no nothing, you just end up with a bunch of people in there that either just focus on selling their stuff because there's not really any other value in being a part of that community or they go in there and like no one's talking or engaging. I asked a question, nobody answered. This sucks. And then they disengage and you never get them back. So that's why you kind of end up in, in one of those two directions. Um, we've managed to kind of walk that very narrow line in the middle. Um, and what, what quite a few people have told us is that what they're really impressed about is that there's a lot more signal and a lot less noise than in other communities. So um, if you ask a question, you will get thoughtful, detailed responses from other SaaS founders, like successful founders as well, because we filter out anyone who's just idea stage. You've got to be making five grand a month in order to join. Um, you got to draw a line in this end somewhere. So that's the particular line that we decided to draw. But, you know, we got like a third of our members are doing over a million bucks a year. So it's quite a high caliber group of people. And if you only take founders of SaaS businesses, they've got enough in common to be able to really help each other. Um, there's a there's a group called Vistage, which is like a, it's a bit older now, but it's a sort of chapter-based local geographic area. And, and you go along and you meet other successful entrepreneurs in your area and you you meet up and you go to someone's office and you kind of have a bit of a mastermind and you talk through your problems. Um, and that's, that's great in theory and a lot of people enjoy it. It's really expensive for a start, um, but there's no niche focus with that. So you'll have someone who's building a SaaS business at the same table, you've got someone who owns a trucking company and someone over there is a real estate agent. Someone over there owns a law firm. Like how much do you really have in common? You know, you, at, a, at a surface level, sure, but you don't really have that much. You, okay, cool. Yeah, guys, my, uh, my, my, uh, my CAC is out of control. Uh, my churn rate is through the roof and I go, need to bring it down. What is a guy who, you know, drives trucks for a living or has a bunch of guys driving trucks for a living. What is, what's he going to tell you? Is he going to be able to give you meaningful advice? Of course not. Um, now I'm not taking a giant dump on, on Vistage, but it just, it's a different community that serves a different purpose. The value in that is you get to meet people from other industries and you get to meet people that, you know, maybe the guy in the law firm can help you or he knows someone who can and stuff like that. Um, but we just focus on SaaS. We only allow founders and CEOs in, um, and we don't allow direct competitors in. So we kind of facilitate that whole, you can share things privately. Um, there aren't too many spaces where you can do that. And so what you will find is that if you join Startup Source, you get, you ask a question, you will get detailed answers from other SaaS founders that are useful. You know, you will get people are jumping in offering to give you feedback on your website and, you know, hey, I know someone, do you want to talk to someone at Google? I've got a friend who works there. Let me connect you up and we can see if we can get your, your account sorted out. Or, um, hey, actually, this is, this looks really cool. Like, do you want to partner up on this? Maybe, you know, we, we can blast out to our email list about your product because I think they'd benefit from it as well. You get a lot more cooperation and a lot more partnership and a lot more people legitimately helping each other. Um, and that's what makes us different. And, and I have to say that the other nice thing about our community is it's not based on a guru. Like you mentioned, like Alex Hormozzi and these guys, you know, great guys, really cool, but they build this whole community and it's all based on them kind of a thing, you know. So you have to, you get maybe like a, a someone sends a video to you and, you know, 
there's not really a connection between the members. And, and I think that's what I really like about our community as well is there's a connection between the members. You know, they if they're in the, the, the same country as one of the other members, you know, they make a point of meeting up with each other and, you know, they send us photos. And I think that's that's a really cool thing to to kind of have as a community as well. Um, I want to change tack just a little bit. So, Ryan, you've you've been talking to a lot of SaaS founders and you've been spending like a lot of your time in the past 10 years, more or less, talking to different founders. So my question is, what is the biggest mistake that you see SaaS founders making? Ooh, this is, this is a goodie. Um, so in my experience, most SaaS founders underestimate how much work they need to put into marketing to actually make it make things happen. So, so we took over the SaaS marketing subreddit at, at the start of the year. Um, basically, it's like a free intro community for earlier stage founders, and then some of them will graduate into the startup source community. Um, what you will notice about Reddit, as much as I love it, as great as it is, there are a lot of people who post a question, I built this thing, how do I get customers for it? Now, first of all, if that's your approach, you you're probably, you're probably stuffed up. Like you, you should start by have. I've got a customer who has this problem. Um, he's given me some money. Now I need to build this thing. How do I build it? That's a much better question to answer. Um, but I built a thing. How do I sell it? Is is the, is putting the cart before the horse? It's the wrong way of, of approaching things. Um, whenever I do business coaching, and I do that from from time to time. Um, I you know, mentored a few startup accelerators. I do that privately. I've done I've done quite a lot of that. Um, it is amazing how many people that have one marketing channel that's kind of working okay. Um, and they're like, yes, yeah, you know, so SEO is working, but I'm thinking of, maybe I should do some Facebook ads or should, should, I, should I reach out to affiliates? Or you know, I'm thinking about well, you know, like, does TikTok work for, for SaaS? Like, can I do that instead? And like, and, and I cannot tell you how many times I've had to say like, you've got one channel that you've barely scratched the surface of and you're already looking for, for channel number two or three or four. So I had a, I had a mentor once who uh, told me something that really stuck with me. And it's that there's, Everyone's looking for a silver bullet, but the reality is there's no silver bullet. There's just a shitload of lead ones. So instead of looking for this this one magic thing that's suddenly going to make a, make your business mild, you know, wildly successful, um, if you've got something that's working, like finding one channel that works is really hard. If you've got a channel that's working, max it out. Like how do you double down on that? If you're doing SEO, cool. How do you generate more content? How do you build more backlinks? Um, how do you, you know, what other tactics can you apply to, to get you ranking for more keywords? Like, you know, you've got something that's working. How do I make that work much, much better before I even think about looking for another channel? Cause finding another channel that works is a process and it's difficult to do. I, um, in a, in a, in a previous life before I was doing this, I used to run a, a marketing consultancy in, in London with a, with a friend of mine and we were working with early stage tech companies that had sort of. They had some semblance of product market fit. They, they'd raised a round of funding um, and they'd kind of use these one shot marketing channels. So they'd done a big PR blitz or they'd emailed everybody that they knew or they launched on AppSumo or, you know, at the time product hunt when that mattered more than it does today. Um, so they, they'd done this kind of one shot thing and they're like, okay, now how do I get customers? What they, what they hadn't built was a scalable and repeatable engine for acquiring customers. So what we would do is we would come in and systematically test out a whole lot of different marketing channels, find something that looked like it had legs, and then we'd double down on that. We'd build some systems and processes. We'd bring someone in to you know, figure, it, figure out how to do it, and then we'd bring someone else in and train them to run that specific channel. But, but that whole process of testing out different marketing channels and then figuring out which ones can work, like that's a very specialized skill. And it's a very expensive process and it's a very time consuming process because, you know, you're rolling the dice. It's, it's an experiment. You have to, and, and you might have to try out five or six different channels before you hit on one that works. And it might not even work as well as your original channel, you know. So um, if you're a really early stage startup, you can't afford to be placing that many bets and have them all fall over. When you've got something that's kind of working, it is so much better to just double down on that. Um, so, so in terms of mistakes, those are the two big ones, right? So the first one is... Um, scratching your own itch. I think I did an episode with Aaron Cassover from Agent Methods, and he was talking about that as being completely the wrong way of, of, of building building a business. And and just to unpack that a little bit more, most like humans are really bad at coming up with truly original ideas. What we're good at is seeing taking an idea from over here and an idea from over here and matching them together. Now, because most SaaS businesses are started by technical founders because they can code, they can build the thing themselves. Um, 
They mostly solve problems that developers are exposed to on a daily basis. You know, that's why there's a bajillion and one food ordering apps. The world doesn't need more of those. Um, the world doesn't need more photo sharing apps. The world doesn't need more, you know, dev tools. The world doesn't need, like, all those niches are completely saturated because there's been another developer who had a problem thought, I can build a solution to this. Those opportunities are gone now. What, what you need to find is, you know, and yet, and yet, um, like, there was a guy who joined Startup Source a while back, and he had a software product for children's entertainers. Right. So I love this idea. So um, he used to be a magician and he would go and do kids parties as a magician and he'd do magic tricks in front of kids. So there'd be like, you know, the guy who does like the balloon animals or there'd be someone that brings like jumping castles along, all that stuff. Um, do you know how many software engineers are building solutions for that space? Zero. OK, so you're competing against nothing. Um, that's a way better space to be. And like and the, the great thing about that business is it's like people spend a lot of money on these kids parties. Um, you probably can't build a billion dollar business in that space. It's not that big, but you can build a $50 million business. You might even be able to build a hundred million dollar business out of that. So the nice thing about it is there's a lot of money in that space. It's ignored by pretty much everyone because it's a bit unusual and a bit off, you know, off the beaten path. Um, but VC backed competitors are going to ignore it because it's too small because you can't build a billion dollar business out of it. So there's this vacant space with a big opportunity that nobody's come across simply because the people with the ability to build a product in that space never encounter that problem unless they have kids and they, you know, invite a magician to their kid's party and they get talking to the magician and ask him about his business. That's the only way you come across it. The, the reason this guy came across it is because he studied software engineering in college and then decided on a complete career change and was a, was a kid's entertainer for a while. That's the only reason he came across it. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunities out there yet to be solved. Very few of them are encountered by software engineers on a daily basis. So if you are a more technical founder, um, start making friends with people who are in other industries because there are so many problems out there that you will never come across. But like, or just whenever you meet someone who runs a business, get them, like talk to them about it. Tell me about your business. How do you do it? What problems do you encounter? Like be curious about this. Um, so, much, so much of the world is dependent on either pen and paper or Excel. You know, we're in 2024 now and so much of the world economy still relies on those two tools. Um, you know, you, you, there's probably a software solution that would make a massive difference in that industry. I, I was talking to a guy who does... Um, like uh, learning management stuff for oil companies, okay? Like that's not something you immediately think of when you think SaaS, but he's built like a $20 million business out of that. Sorry, $20 million a year in revenue. Like not his business is worth $20 million. It's probably worth you know, $100 million. Um, so there, there are opportunities out there that, that exist um, if you look outside of just building a better mousetrap and scratching your own itch. That's the wrong way to build a business. Find a real problem that you can solve that has not been solved yet or you know, has not been solved well. Um, or focus on, you know, a, a particular niche. Yes, there are tools available, but they don't really serve this market very well. Let's niche down and focus on that. So um, building a, a product that is actually needs to exist in the world instead of just another me too copy, I'm doing the thumbs up thing again. That's weird how it does that. Um, okay, that's that's one mistake that people make. Um, and the, the second mistake that people make is that they underestimate how much time and effort and energy you need to put into marketing to actually get in front of customers. And there was, um, I wanted to jump in when you were saying uh, one of the founders, you know, um, he, he he solved the problem, you know, like the, the kids party thing. You interviewed someone who also said, you know, he went and loaded trucks with people in Missouri. I think he started loading trucks, Kyle, started talking yeah. to to truckers and he came he came across their problem and he built a whole business of that. I think he had like a super success, successful mm -hmm. exit just because he started loading trucks with people. But Going back to what you were saying about product market fit, so there's a lot of buzz around that world, uh, word. A lot of people are saying product market fit and so on. So there's there are a lot of definitions about it, and I feel like everyone has heard of it. But I want to ask you, what is founder channel fit? Hey, it's Ryan here. I'm glad you're enjoying the video. Listen, if you want to meet me or some of the people that I interview, you should really join the Startup Source SaaS Founder community. It's a private Slack group for SaaS founders based outside of Silicon Valley who are past the idea stage and want to focus on growth. About 30% of our members are doing over a million dollars a year in revenue. So it's a pretty high caliber group. You'll get access to regular mastermind calls and workshops. And every week we share exclusive marketing tactics and resources that you can use to grow your business faster. So if you want to give yourself an unfair advantage and learn from other SaaS founders who are one or two steps ahead of you, head over to startupsource.com and sign up. I think there's a link in the description down below as well. Anyway, I'll see you in there.
So this is this is a little <coughs> little idea of mine. So I think everyone's familiar with product market fit at, at this stage of the game. People, you know, like in a nutshell, build something that people want, um, or build something that people want and are willing to pay for. In brackets, that's the bit that a lot of people neglect. Um, so th there is actually a strict definition because I'm a nerd about this stuff, and that's the the, the Sean Ellis definition, which is um, if you surveyed all of your users and asked them, would they be very disappointed if they could no longer use this product, 40% or more of them would say, yeah, I'm, I'd be very disappointed if I no longer could, could use the thing that you made. That's the strict definition of product market fit. Um, most people that I talk to probably don't get to exactly that stage. That It's not zero, but it's not 40%. It's sort of somewhere in between. And that means you're, you're on the right path, but you just need to tinker with it a little bit more. Certainly, it doesn't mean that you need to, you can't go out and get in front of customers until you get to 40%. Like, you know, you should be going out and, and, and talking to more customers anyway. And just treat that as a de de destination to get to. Um, I think everyone's familiar with product market fit at this point. However, there are a lot of businesses that have product market fit that still fail. And the reason for that is even if you've got an amazing product and it is perfect and there's a market over here with a clear problem that hasn't been solved and your product solves that problem amazingly, you still need to get it in front of them. You, the founder, still need to find a channel that you can use effectively to get in front of them. And, and so founder and channel are the missing parts of that equation. Um, the, I'll give you, let me unpack that a little bit more and then I'll give you a proper, proper example of it. Um, so not every marketing channel is viable for every market or every product. Um, if you're doing enterprise sales, um, you know, million dollar a year contracts, heavy, heavy, heavy enterprise software, TikTok is probably not the right channel to do that. Um, you know, you want to sell to executives in their 60s, they're probably not on TikTok late at night. And they certainly don't base their purchasing decisions based on, you know, the, whatever they, they, they saw on their mobile at, at 2 a.m. Um, the so, so that's the wrong channel for that market. Even if you've got an amazing product and it, there is a clear, definite need, that's the wrong channel for it. Um, at the same time, uh, maybe the right channel is just just outbound sales. You just need to be really good at getting in touch with these people, calling them, emailing them, not giving up until you get in front of them. When you get in front of them, you make a great impression and they want to take the meeting and you're able to, to sell to them effectively. Um, what if you're really bad at sales? Um, what if you're a 20-year-old kid uh, and, and you just can't, you know, they don't take you seriously because these are guys in their 60s, okay? Um, that might be exactly the right channel to get your product to the market. Channel fit is perfect, but it's the wrong fit for you as the founder. And because early on, the founder is gonna be the one doing the marketing, one of the founders is gonna be the one doing the marketing, you need to make sure that the, the channel is the right channel, but you are the right founder for that channel. You can use that channel effectively. Um, so by, by way of an example, um, I got a friend, you know him as well, I'm not gonna name names, but um, he joined a startup source and he had a business in the travel space. Um, amazing idea. So basically what he was doing is you can get access to the hotel room inventory that Expedia and booking.com and everything else, they buy it at wholesale rates and they sell it to you at retail rates. They just add a markup and sell it, sell it back to you. Um, so his idea was, well, if we could get access to it at the wholesale rate and we could just get people to pay a membership fee and they would get access to those hotel rooms at the wholesale rate, they could save... 30, 40, 50% on, on hotel rooms. That's massive. Like that's, that's a lot of money. Um, why is nobody doing this? This makes perfect sense. Um, now I know independently, I know two other people that have had almost the same idea, you know, so to a T the, the exact same idea, the, I think the exact same source of inventory as well, because I don't think there's that many in the world. Um, all of them failed. And the reason why it fell over is because even though it's a great idea, even though there's a clear need for it, even though there's this product market fit there, um, when you buy a, when you buy a hotel room, what you're really doing is it's, it's all search based. Um, you either need to be on top for Google ads, or you need to be on top of the search results at the point of, at the point where you search for hotel rooms in Vegas, hotel rooms in, you know, um, Sao Paulo, hotel rooms in London, whatever it is. Um, you need to appear at the top of the search results or you need to appear at the top of the Google ads. And those are the only two channels that really work in that space. Um, you can do TikTok videos about it. You can stick stuff up on Instagram, but if I'm not ready to buy a hotel room right now in that instant, cool, that's great. I'm going to ignore it. And then I'm going to Google when I'm actually ready to buy a hotel room. So um, even though 
uh, the, the, you know, he had product market fit. He didn't have founder channel fit because um, that channel, like to outrank those guys in SEO is going to require a lot of money and a lot of expertise. Um, to beat them at Google Ads is going to require a lot of money. So the, the, the founder that you need is someone who is skilled at raising capital, knows a lot about Google Ads, knows a lot about uh, SEO. And the guy who started this was none of those things. So he wasn't able to get his product in front of customers. He didn't have found a channel fit, even though he had product market fit. And that's why it failed. But how, how would someone know, like you're talking about, like, you know, if you don't have found a channel fit, what to do, but how would you know if you don't have it? So, so a lot of the time um, people don't know which channels work. Sometimes that's obvious. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you need to just test it out. Um, I did some work years ago with a company. So, you know, basically standing in as a, a, a fractional CMO and they, they already had a CMO. But this particular CMO was an absolute weapon at Facebook ads. It's just that after they hired him, he figured out that there was no way he could get the ads profitable um, because it, they just had too many competitors with much deeper pockets and their product, you know, at the pricing point that they were charging with the conversion rates they had, um, you know, they, their competitors all had other, other products and services and other shit to sell. So the lifetime value was just way higher. Um, and he's like, it doesn't matter how good I am. I'm world-class at Facebook ads. I can't make this work. The problem is that he didn't know how to do anything else. So they were kind of stuck with this CMO that was amazing at the thing, but it was the wrong thing. Um, and that, that happens quite a lot. I've seen that exact scenario play out quite a few times. Um, especially if the founders don't know anything about marketing, they just assume that, well, we'll hire someone who's good and they'll make the channel work. And sometimes the channel just is the wrong channel for that business. Um, similarly, like I, I used to run a, a cold email business and sometimes it'd be like, hey, we, we do everything right. And sometimes it just doesn't work. And it might be the offer just wasn't very good. You know, even if the targeting was on point, even if, you know, technically we were landing in the inbox and doing everything we can to improve deliverability. We had amazing copy and everything else. Sometimes that's just the wrong channel for a particular business. Um, I, I think we, we tried that once selling to um, like mechanics and like auto repair places. These guys have their fingers covered in grease all day long. They're out there on the tools. They're not in front of their laptop all the time. It's just the wrong channel for that audience. You need to pick up the phone and call them or you need to walk in and see them personally. That's the channel that works in that industry. Um, if you tried picking up the phone and or just walking into um, you know, a bunch of software developers, they're not going to respond well to it. You need to email those people or you need to go through Twitter. Like that, Those are the channels that they, you know, or you put out some content and they read it. Those are the channels that they respond to. So um, so, so, so you, you can kind of know a bit about founder channel fit. Well, founder, founder channel fit is like, do you personally have the skills or the ability to execute on that channel? But um, knowing the right channel partly comes from understanding your customers and how they like to buy. Um, I think in the episode we did with Aaron Cassover, he talked about how as a techie, he hated the idea of picking up the phone and, and talking to people. Like that was annoying. He didn't want that. Um, but most of his customers are insurance agents and all of his customers are insurance agents. That's They like getting on the phone and talking to people. They want to talk to you. Um, so the moment they started doing more calls with people is the moment his business started taking off. And it took him, he said, I think an embarrassingly long amount of time <laughs> before he, he got to that point of, of, of realization. So um, you can you can kind of understand which channels are going to work and which channels are not going to work based on your understanding of the target market. But again, that comes from deeply understanding who it is you're selling to and the problems that they face, but also how they like to buy solutions. Um, the, the other approach that you can take is what we were doing back when I was running an agency, which is just systematically run a series of experiments, give it a month, invest you know a couple of thousand bucks max to see if it works. That's not a perfect approach though, something like content marketing takes longer than a month to see if it's going to work or not. Um, you know, starting a podcast. Okay, cool. In a month, you crank out a couple of episodes and publish them and uh, you're not getting a million visits to your websites. Guess it doesn't work then. No, it's just that it's, it's a slower channel. So that's not a perfect method either. Um, but if you kind of just work backwards from how does everyone else buy this in this space? Because it's not going to be, it's not going to be every channel. There's usually only a few channels that work. That's how everyone else is buying it. Am I good at those particular channels? Yes or no? Um, if those are the only channels that work and I'm not good at them, I might have the best product in the world, but I either need to find a co-founder who is good at these things. Um, or maybe if you've got enough money to do it, maybe you can hire a really good 
agency or a really good marketer or a really good something else that does have those those channels. Or maybe if those channels require a lot of money, you need a founder who can go out and, and get access to the capital to, to do it. Or I suppose the other option would be, you know, join a great community like ours and then get some, <laughs> get some feedback from people who can give you like inside info of, hey, this really isn't working because we've done that for a few of our founders as well, where we saw, look, this just isn't a viable idea. This isn't working. Try something different or, or see if you can pivot. But going back to just like giving advice and asking asking for advice, um, what advice would you give to an early stage SaaS business if they're bootstrapped? A little bit different if you're B2B or B2C. Most people in the startup source community are B2B. So I'm going to mostly focus on B2B SaaS with this answer. But um, if you're bootstrapping, you can't afford to go for years and years and years before you make any money out of it. Um, so like, I, I don't think you can bootstrap a consumer internet business. I think bootstrapping a marketplace is really difficult. I think bootstrapping freemium is pretty difficult. I think I did a video on that a while back as well. That's that's a hard thing to do and probably something you should never do. But um, if you're bootstrapping, you need something that is going to generate revenue quickly um, before you've really optimized your website, before, you know, before you've got all your marketing collateral and lead magnets and follow-up sequences and all that stuff. That's all great. Most people don't have that immediately and they can't wait, you know, six 12, 18 months to, to develop all that before they start selling it. So um, there's a bit of a blueprint that I, I tend to, you know, this is this is a general blueprint. So, you know, your mileage may vary, but, but, but I'll just kind of outline it for you. So you should start with uh, cold email. The reason you start with cold email is because it's cheap and it's fast and it's targeted. So you can literally reach out to the exact person and the exact company that you want to work with. Um, quite often people say, oh, I'm getting all these... I'm getting all these leads coming in, but they're too small or they're price sensitive or whatever. It's like, cool, inbound stuff, you you catch what you catch. With outbound, with cold email, cold calling, you can go after the companies that you want to work with. Um, and that's that's a big, big game changer because you can go after companies that have the money to just, yeah, sure, we'll pay for it. It's a much easier sell and it's probably more lucrative than trying to squeeze money out of people that, you know, really are very price sensitive. So if you start with cold email, um, if you're... B2B and you've got a, a decent annual contract value. So a customer is worth, say, more than you know five thousand uh, dollars a year to you. Um, you can just focus on directly reaching out to customers, get them on a call, sell to them directly. The the beauty of that is that you even if your website looks like crap, it doesn't matter because they're probably not going to look at the website. You're going directly from email to a phone call. Everything else is just irrelevant. So um, you can. Um, if you're going B two C, or because you can't cold email consumers, or you're targeting um, B two B customers that are towards the, the bottom end, they're very small businesses. Um, you can go well in the B two B setting. You can go directly to and sell directly. Um, what's often a better approach is to try and use cold email to get in front of partners. So someone who has access to an email list, a community, um, a social media following, an audience in some way, shape, or form of your target customers, cold email them and then do a promotion and put, get in, get out in front of them. That's often a, a better way of reaching them. And you know, using other people's audiences to grow is a really um, uh, underutilized channel, I think, for a lot of, a lot of SaaS founders. So um, blueprint is start with cold email because it's cheap and targeted and fast and you need something that's going to bring in revenue quickly, get you talking to customers quickly. While you know, I get that cranking, the next thing that you want to focus on is content. And it depends a little bit on how much search volume there is for your keywords in, in, in your space. Um, if there's lots of search volume for the keywords, you know, the, the people are looking for your kind of a solution, you search for email marketing software. Lots of people are searching for that every every month. Um, okay, start blogging, start creating written content that is easily indexed on Google, start creating that on your website and building some links to it. Now, the thing about content and SEO, it's usually the cheapest channel, but it's slow. And it takes a while to snowball. And eventually, once it builds up momentum, it's great. It's fantastic. But even if you do everything right, it's going to take you six to 12 months to get that snowball moving. Um, and most SaaS, most bootstrap SaaS can't afford to sit around for 12 months without getting any 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 customer leads or, or, or customers um, in the door. So that's why we start with cold email because it's faster. So you do cold email. Then you do content and SEO. Um, if there's no search volume in your space, maybe it's a, a new thing, maybe it's just something that people don't think to search for, maybe it's the kind of thing that people don't realize they need until they see it, you want to focus on case studies and you want to focus on video content that showcase using your product and how people will benefit from it. Then you use that content 
and you add it back into your cold email sequences to add more value to it. Um, with, with cold email, quite often, you know, um, a lot of people struggle with it because they, there's nothing else for them to do. They, you send an email out, people don't get on a phone call, then you just nag them until they do. And that's not, nobody wants to engage with that. That's annoying. Um, so you want to be adding value with all the, the rest of the emails in your sequence. One way to do that is, hey, here's a case study about a business just like yours that got these great results. Um, hey, here's a video we created that shows you how to use this in combination with this other tool. Like that's a fantastic way to do it. So you want to, you either create content that is going to help you rank in search engines or you create content that is going to help amplify and improve your cold email sequences. And depending on the search volume, that, that will indicate which, which way you should go with that. The third thing that you want to do, regardless of whether you're B2B or B2C or anything in between, um, is you want to look at partnerships. The thing about partnerships is that there's kind of this magical window where you should focus on partnerships because you either fo focus on them at the very beginning, um, like I said, with you know, use cold email to build the partnerships. Um, or you focus on them a little bit later on once you've got some other stuff working because then it, it takes a lot of time and a lot of legwork and you, the founder, you're not going to have time to do partnerships if you're trying to write blog posts and do guest posting to build backlinks and you're trying to get this email, cold email campaign together. You're just not going to have, have enough time. So until you're at a point where you can get someone else to do one of those things, you know, you either do partnerships at the very beginning or you do partnerships after you've got those other two channels working. But um, partnerships can take multiple different forms. You know, you can find people who are affiliates and they're going to promote, you know, your product for you. You give them a cut. You can find, uh, you can do content-based partnerships. So find people that are selling to a similar audience and like, hey, it could be a guest post. Hey, I'll run a webinar for your audience. So you've got some interesting content to invite them to and engage them. Um, hey, I'll, I'll speak at your event. Um, hey, I'll, uh, quite often early on, what you're doing is you are exchanging your content, knowledge, expertise for their access to their audience because they've got a much bigger audience than you do. Um, I've got a friend who has a really clever tactic and I, I recommend this because it costs no money. But once you've got a little bit of an email list, like a few thousand people on it, um, go and find people that are around about your size or they have a similar sized email list or social media following or audience in some capacity. And you do a shout out for shout out. So uh, you say, hey, you know, email this to your audience and I'll email about you to mine and we both win. And you do that deal every single week or even multiple times a week with every different partner. So he does it on a Saturday. He sends one email out every Saturday, which means that in a year, he is getting access to 52 other lists with you know, a similar audience on those lists. There's going to be some overlap. Some of the people on his list are already going to be a part of that list. Some of the people on list A are going to be a part of list B, but... Um, when you add them all up, he's suddenly getting exposure to lots and lots of other people and it costs him nothing. It's just, just a bit of legwork involved in organizing that. It's a great marketing tactic that not many people utilize. Absolutely. And like it has a lot of potential for, for success and for, for continuous growth. So you were talking about this all related to bootstrap SaaS, but how would your advice be different if a business is funded? The fundamentals are the same. It's just you need to move a little bit faster. So the, you know, the... The, the biggest mistake that bootstrap SaaS founders make, in my opinion, is that they think ads first. Their first response is, let's just pump a bunch of money to Google and Facebook ads, and then they burn through their budget and they die. Um, if you have raised some money, you can actually afford to spend some money on ads. Um, I wouldn't expect them to be profitable. The reason you spend money on ads early on as a funded business, as a funded SaaS, is to figure out your audience and figure out your messaging faster because you can quantitatively test stuff. Um, that's a bad idea if you bootstrap because you've got a limited marketing budget to work with. You kind of just need to give it your best guess. But you can be scientific about it if you've got some money to spend. Um, so you create a bunch of ads and you just, you know, here's one way, here's one version of the messaging. Here's a different version of explaining what we do. Here's a different version of explaining what we do. And you just, you know, systematically test these things until you hit on one that has a higher click-through rate. Um, and then you stick that up on your landing page and you A-B test a bunch of landing pages and then you see. So um, when you're funded, the, the the principles are the same, but the the pace at which you need to move is a lot faster. So you need to do multiple things in parallel instead of let's do cold email, get that working. And that might take six months to figure it out and, and, and get it properly cranking and get it organized and systemized and maybe even get someone else in to, to, to run it for you or train someone up. Um, now we're going to do content. Um, no. You do cold email. At the same time, you do content. At the same time, you're probably doing Facebook ads. You know, you the lessons that you learn from your your Facebook or Google ads, ah, this sort of messaging really resonates with the person looking for this. Okay, cool. 
Let's feed that back into our cold email campaigns. Let's incorporate that into our content. Um, hey, th- this this particular um, industry segment seems to be really interested in our product. Okay, we need to go and get some case studies in that particular space because all our case studies are in a completely different segment. So you need to be doing multiple things at once. Um, you've the, the thing about raising money is that that sort of starts a clock ticking, and if an investor is giving you a bunch of money because they're expecting a return in a certain time frame. So you need to move a lot faster, and that means you need to do multiple things at once. Directionally, it's still pretty much the same, except that you can afford to spend some money on ads, and you can afford to hire people a little bit faster. So what you might want to do is like, hey, you know, coming back to the founder channel fit idea, um, founders really good at SEO. You might want to hire an agency to do cold email for you or you might want to hire people doing cold calls in a call center or you might want to hire a, you know someone who knows a bit about google and facebook ads you might want to um, join an affiliate network and get them to you know get you a whole bunch of affiliates to get out and and, and, and promote product um like so so you work with you know whatever the founder is already good at focus on that assuming it's the right channel focus on that but then if there are other channels as well that your founder isn't so good at or doesn't have the time to do that's when you use the capital that you've raised to be able to do those things now rather than waiting, you know, six to 12 months to be able to execute on them because you do need to move faster. That's very, very good advice what you were saying there. But that also brings me to the point that a lot of times when they say, okay, this founder is good at this channel, but now we need someone who's good at that. So Mm -hmm. what I've seen a lot of founders do is say, okay, I'm great at marketing, but I need someone or I'm great at coding. I need someone who's good at marketing. So I need a co-founder. Do you think you really need a co-founder to be successful? Ooh, this is this is the million dollar question. So, bit of bit of a side note. Um, I used to run in a previous life. I used to run an event called Co-founder Speed Date. So instead of you know, usually men and women on the opposite sides of the table, you would have hackers on one side and hustlers on the other side of the table, and you kind of rotate through so you get to you get to meet everyone. It's like speed dating, but but for finding a, a co-founder. Um, so I've got a few thoughts on that. The the conventional wisdom, well. Yeah, the conventional wisdom is that you are much more likely to succeed if you have a, succeed if you have a co-founder. Um, that's mostly driven by the sort of Silicon Valley VC-backed approach. Um, most startup accelerator programs will not accept you as a solo founder. They want you to be a, to- a team of two or three. Um, I think sometimes there's a little bit of wiggle room on that if you're particularly exceptional, but you know, 99 point something percent of all the founding team, the old 5,000 companies that have gone through Y Combinator um, had two or three founders. Um, so, so the reason they give for that is you have multiple different skill sets that can be complementary. Makes sense. Um, if one founder gets sick or something happens to them, you've got someone else that can continue running the company. You, you don't have all your eggs in one you know, key person risk. That that's less of a less of an issue. Um, and on on top of that, you've got access to three people's networks instead of one. Um, and particularly if you need to raise capital, that's a full time job for one founder for the period of time that you're doing. It's a massive distraction, really sucks up a lot of time and effort and energy. So if you've only got one founder and that founder is spending all of their time pitching investors day in, day out for months and months on end, trying to get this round closed, who's running the business at the same time? You know, whereas if you've got another co-founder, the business keeps on chugging while you've got someone else out there raising capital. So it does make sense on the surface why it would be massively advantageous to have multiple co-founders. Here's the counter argument to all of that. Um, most companies at an early stage or not most companies, but a lot of companies fail at an early stage because the founders disagree, you know, and and if you've got three founders, that's even more, more complicated. So founders fundamentally disagree on something. They start arguing all the time. That becomes really distracting. Um, one founder wants to sell the other one wants to stay on. That becomes difficult. Um, one founder, you know, um, I, I was talking to a mate the other day who had this exact same problem. They were going through an accelerator and one of the guys just really missed his girlfriend, didn't want to be there. He wanted to move back home. Okay, what do, what do we do now? Okay, well, now we're a team of three, but that person was our developer or that person was the person who knew the most about the market. Like, does this business still work without that founder involved? This is hard. Um, so th- that those sorts of founder dynamics and founder disputes are a big reason why companies fail that nobody really talks about. Um, the, the, the other thing that, you know, it's kind of a dirty little secret is if you're a VC and you invest in a business, you want there to be multiple co-founders because if there's only one founder and something happens to them, they quit, they get hit by a bus. You as a VC, your, your investment is now a write-off unless you go and you find a replacement CEO or a replacement. Now, finding a replacement CEO for an early stage startup to come in and build an idea that wasn't even theirs, that they're not particularly attached to, 
That's hard. That's difficult. That's time consuming. VCs don't want to do that work. But they, they, they want to protect their investment at the same time. That's why a lot of VCs will tell you you need to have multiple co-founders. Yeah, it's, it helps the business and you've got complementary skill sets. You've got all those other reasons we spoke about. But really, it's about less work for the VC and you know, less risk for the VC. It's ultimately what it comes down to. In my experience, um, so I've, I've had different business partners at different stages for different businesses. Um, quite often, they work pretty well. Um, I did split up with my previous um, co-founder with with Startup Source. So we, we ran the agency together that morphed into the Startup Source community now. Still good friends, still still on good terms and stuff like that. But the, the fundamental breakdown was I had to leave the UK. You know, it wasn't up to me. Like I couldn't get a visa, but I had to leave the UK, which meant that um, I thought that I would handle one half of the world and he would handle the other half of the world. And we'd both get on sales calls. We'd both get on community calls. And he just didn't want to do the calls. It's like, that's that's not what we signed up to. When we started working together, we were running an agency together. And the deal then was you would do the sales, Ryan, and I would deliver the work. And that worked beautifully while we were running an agency. But circumstances changed because I couldn't stay in the UK. So I couldn't continue running the agency. So we had to change the business model. And he was right. It wasn't what he signed up for. So that's why why we why we separated parted ways. Um, but that was a massive distraction. And you know the, the business wasn't really in a point where you know, it, it, it was really designed for two people to be running it, not one. That that changed things pretty significantly. So no, you don't need a co-founder to be successful. I think it can be helpful in certain circumstances. Um, the the problems that I've seen with co-founders, so founder disputes, that's the big downside to having a co-founder. You might just fundamentally disagree on it or something happens like completely outside your control. Life gets in the way. You know, you, your partner um, wants to have kids and suddenly you're like, oh, I need a lot more. I need to bring in a lot more cash now. I need a lot more job security than this startup provides. I need to quit now. Oh, God, okay, well, now I need to find a co-founder because who's going to replace you? You know, like all that stuff is what, what often sinks startups. Um, you don't need a co-founder. It is advantageous to have some have one sometimes, but think very carefully about it. What I would be reluctant to do is to bring on a co-founder that you haven't really worked with before, that you're not already friends with, that you don't already know. Um because it's, you know, my old business partner used to say, like, he spent more time talking to me than he did to his wife. That, that was true because, you know, we, we'd spend like eight to 10 hours a day, you know, working with each other. So it's a big commitment to, 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 to you know, share a big part of your life and also your main income source and, the, you know, your baby, the project that you've been building. You've got to give up half of that to have a co-founder. You've got to give up two thirds of that if you've got two co-founders. Um, so... I think you want to think long and hard about bringing on a co-founder and you want to make sure that if you do, it's someone you can work with really well. Um, it's someone that has a complementary skill set to your own. Um, what you want to avoid is someone who's just going to bring in money. I've seen that happen. That's a terrible idea um, because you spend the money. Great. Now half my company is dead weight. What do I do with that? Um, so you want someone with a complementary skill set. You want someone that you have ideally known for a while. Um, sometimes people say you should never go into business with friends. I tend to skew the other direction and think that if you're going to give up half your company, it would want to be to someone that you know you can trust. Um, but I had a mentor once who said that you, the best bit of advice about co-founders is if you're thinking about starting a business with someone, go out and get ludicrously drunk with them first because then you see how people really are. If you are still good friends in the morning, then you can start a business together. If you hate each other, you got in a dumb argument after a few beers, mm, probably not the right person to, to go into business with. Um, incidentally, there's kind of a, a bit of a side note. I don't know if we want to talk about um, tools and books and recommendations and all that kind of stuff, but um, the, the issue of how you split up the co-founder equity often comes up quite a bit. Um, I don't think that it should just be 50-50 by default. I think you want to do the, you know, the, the standard sort of Silicon Valley, so for anyone who's not aware of this, um, you have a four-year vesting schedule. So if you're entitled to... Uh, let's say 10% of the company um, or 10% of the shares, you don't get that 10% on day one. You earn it gradually month by month over four years. Um, and it's usually four years with a one-year cliff. What that means is that you earn nothing for the first year. And then after the first year, you know, your one quarter of that, so 2.5%, you get your 2.5% at the end of 12 months. And then you earn a little bit more each month until by the end of year four, you've got your full 10% allocation. The reason they do that is... That gives you a year to figure out if this is the right person or not. If they're not the right person, you can fire them without giving up any equity. Um, 
if, but what it also does is it makes sure that you're tied to the business. So if you get, you know, your 10% on day one, okay, you show up for a week and you're like, thanks guys, I'm out of here. I'll go get another job and get another 10% from over there and get another 10% from over there. You, th- there is a major problem, by the way, that a lot of people will stay for a year, get their first year of, of equity and then jump ship and go somewhere else. So just keeping people long-term is, is really difficult as well. So anyway, I think that if you are going to take on a co-founder, you don't necessarily allocate equity based on let's just go halvesies on this. I think that's a, a dumb approach to take. Um, you want to allocate it based on the amount of time, the skills that they bring, the network that they bring, you factor in any money if that's a part of it. Um, you know, you, you want to take everything into consideration. There's a really good tool. I think it's founders, founder. There's an equity calculator. So basically you go through and say like, you know, founder number one contributes this. Founder number two does the blogging. Founder number three is the one coding everything. Uh, but founder number one is the one who's probably going to be pitching investors. And founder number two does it. So you kind of figure out all the tasks that people will be doing. Um, and it will spit out like a rough estimate of, you know, how much equity allocation each founder should get based on what they're contributing um, a little bit out of date now, you know, so, so I, I wouldn't take that as gospel, but I would take it as a, a good starting point for, a, you know, if you and your founder are going through this negotiation, go and do the calculator together and use that as a starting point to figure out exactly who gets what. Um, but you, you sort of want one founder, I think, to have a little bit more than everybody else so that if there is a dispute, you can just say, I'm going to pull rank on this. I have one more share than you do. I'm going to I'm going to make the call. Um, and you need that to resolve roadblocks sometimes absolutely and and you know um we we spoke to someone i think you were on that call with me um where someone said um you know co-founders can be great and so on but it's always better to have no co-founder than to have a bad co-founder yeah that's true absolutely true (laughs) so ryan with all the other interviews you often ask entrepreneurs what their secret sauce is so this is something that they're really good at or a unique insight about their space now my question to you is what's your secret sauce Mm, great question Without tooting my own trumpet too much, um, I'm really good at connecting with people. Um, you are. I'm a good marketer, but I'm a great connector. When when I first got into the startup scene, I was a kid in like my early twenties, and I did I did economics at university, so not relevant to startups in any way, shape, or form. And so um, I tried teaching myself to code. I was terrible at it. Um, hadn't come across marketing yet. I could talk to people, but I had no experience doing sales. I, I wasn't very good at that. Um, I thought, okay, well, I want to be in the startup world, but what do I what do I actually have to contribute here? I've got I can't design, I can't code, I can't sell, I can't do marketing. What do I do? I don't have any useful skills. But one thing that I've always been really, really good at is talking to people that are vastly more successful than I am, getting them to like me, getting them to trust me enough to tell me what they need and what they actually what they're looking for. Um, and then I'd go and meet other people and oh, you're good at this thing and you're looking for customers. You've got this thing and you're looking for someone who does X. Well, you guys should talk and I'd connect them up and I'd set them up with an introduction. And you do that a couple of times, you start to get a reputation for a really useful guy to know because every recommendation, every introduction that he sends me is quality. He, he can filter out crap people for me and find me exactly what I need. That's a guy I want around around in some capacity. Um, now that was that was a really difficult skill to monetize. You, know, you get like a finder's fee, or you know, you do recruitment stuff, and maybe you get a bit of a bit of a kickback or whatever. But that, I couldn't see how to build a business out of that. That was just you know my my entrepreneurial superpower was that I I tend to be really good at um, meeting people, networking, making good first impression, and then I would stay in touch with people. And after a while, I'd start to say, hey, you know, if you know someone who would benefit from me, send them my way. And so I got that whole kind of informal referral thing. Um, that's been you know a mainstay of, of every business I've run ever since. Interesting thing about startup source as a community, just 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 as a business model, is um, the th- there are lots of other communities out there. Um, some of them are very good. Some of them are crap. You know, it's like like that with everything. The thing about startup source that's quite different that everyone talks about is the fact that hey, everyone in here is actually like good and friendly and cool and interesting and like a, a person that I actually want to connect with. That's why, you know, and every, and when you've got that, people are more likely to engage, people are more likely to help each other. Um, that's because I filter them. I filter everyone who comes into the community. That's, that's the secret source with the community. Um, I've got, a, I've, I've got a good bullshit detector. I think it's probably, the, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can talk to someone I can suss out straight away. Is this someone that's this quality or not? Is this person someone I can trust or not? Do I feel that they're competent or not? Um, and for some reason, I, I, I'm pretty good at 
figuring that out very, very quickly so I can kind of put people into a bucket quickly. You definitely have my endorsement on that. <laughs> definitely. You can spot bullshit from three miles away. And then you can also tell what accent the bullshit is in. So you definitely have my endorsement for that. Well, well, the thing the thing about a, a community, you know, so Startup Source is really kind of the nexus of a community and a coaching program and the best bits of an accelerator program all rolled into one. Um, you know, it's not just a community. It's not just coaching. It's not just, it's, it's all those things combined into one thing. So um, one of the best things that you you want as, as your business grows is, I need, do you know a good SEO agency? Do you know a good IP lawyer? Do you know a good designer? Do you know, hey, like I, I, need, I need an SEO agency, but that one's a little bit too expensive. Do you have one who's decent? Maybe not quite as good as that, but a little bit cheaper. Do you know someone who can do that? Yeah, yeah, I do. And And so what I was doing, on the streets of Sydney as a kid in my early 20s when I had, you know, I, I was good at connecting people and I was doing it in a very manual way, going around to networking events, meeting people, sending email introductions. What we're doing with Startup Source now is like that, but on steroids in a much, much more scalable international way. If you join the Startup Source community and you say, hey, I need X, chances are we can probably find that person for you. We've already got them in your network and we've already filtered them. We already know that they're good. Most of the time they've already been vouched for by someone else in the community. So you've got another founder's recommendation on top of that. And as your business grows, you're going to need to find service providers, agencies, consultants, freelancers, employees to work with. If you can kind of shortcut, like filter out all the shit and get straight to someone who's good quickly, that is a massive value add to, to your business and it speeds things up enormously. And that's something that I happen to be particularly good at. And that's sort of filtered through into what we're doing with, with startup source. Yeah. And it's incredible just for me coming in as an outsider, like they're really, it's a really tight knit, decent community with good people. Like you said, there's no bullshit. There's no drama. It's just, and that's mostly thanks to you. And you set the, you set the tone for the community from the beginning and you propagated that to such an extent that the community members started propagating that. And it really created like a really, really solid community. So Ryan, I wanted to ask you just one last question before we, we end off. What books or resources or tools would you recommend? Like I know you mentioned the one about the founder equity yeah. and there was a book that you mentioned as well, but what mm -hmm. other, other tools and, and resources would you would you recommend? Okay, got, got a bunch for you. Let me, let me pull up my, my list. Um, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is this, this is some, some of the best stuff. Um, so first thing, shameless self-promotion. Uh, if you're building a SaaS business in particular, early on, you want to list on a whole bunch of directories and other websites. We can feature your, your business and get a backlink. Um, you'll get a little bit of traffic from that. You'll get some backlinks which help with SEO. But the, the main benefit of doing that that we found that was kind of surprising is you will get, you know, so if you start featuring on all these um, directories, people will find you there and then they will write blog posts about you. So once we started listing on lots of directories, we started showing up in like top 10 startup community lists or, you know, hey, here are these five entrepreneurial groups that you should join. So people would start writing all these blog posts about us and we were getting more backlinks from that um, without us even asking them or prompting them. I didn't even know who they were. And they found us through this directory and wanted to write, write blogs about us. So um, there is, if you go to startupsource.com forward slash list, find it through the website. I think we'll stick a link down below. Um, you can get a list of 320 uh, directories where you can list your SaaS. I think most of them are free. Um, the whole list is free. You just download it, just, just pop in your email address and we'll send it to you. Um, and that's a really good resource for someone who is early stage and starting out, or even if you've been building your business for a while, but you never really looked into doing directory submissions because it is the um, easiest, fastest, cheapest way to get a whole bunch of quality backlinks very, very quickly. So that's the first resource I'd recommend. Um, I think most SaaS businesses uh, should know something, or most SaaS founders should know something about SEO. Um, ads are getting more and more and more expensive. I, I really would be reluctant. I don't think I've ever seen a business that was successful recently based just on ads alone. I think SEO is a skill that you, you should know something about, even if you don't end up using it a lot in your business or it's not exactly the right channel, you should, you should learn a bit about it. So there are two really good guides to SEO if you don't know anything about it. Um, Moz has a beginner's guide to SEO that is excellent. And Backlinko uh, also has a beginner's guide to SEO that is also excellent in, in, in different ways. So check out both of those if you wanna learn more about SEO. Um, again, both of them are free resources. Um, from a UX standpoint, um, there's a website called useronboard.com. 
Um, I've forgotten the guy's name, but he is amazing. Like it is really, really good. So what he does is he does uh, onboarding teardowns of a lot of really popular sort of web apps that you've heard of, you know, so stuff like uh, Trello, you know, Zapier, um, ClickUp, like all sorts of different tools that you've probably used before. And he goes through their onboarding flow and he comments on it. This is good. This is bad. Should probably move this over here. This would work better if there was a, you know, this photo was above the fold rather than below the fold. Like really, really detailed kind of breakdowns and stuff like that. Um, the, the first skill that I mastered when I got into marketing was conversion rate optimization. And I learned a lot from that website and now he's done so many more. So um, a lot of SaaS businesses struggle with onboarding and conversions and this is a really good free resource to at least get some ideas on what you could be doing differently or better um, to get more of those free trials converting into paid customers or more of those, you know, first time visitors sticking around and actually using using your app. So useronboard.com is, is awesome. Um, in terms of sales, uh, my favorite sales book, it's not really a sales book necessarily, it's about negotiation, is Never Split the Difference. Um, the other one that I'd recommend that's, again, not strictly sales related, but is just communication in general, is a, an oldie but a goodie, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, by Dale Carnegie. Um, it's a little bit, okay, some of the examples are a bit out of date. I think he wrote it in the 1920s or something. So there's an example where like you, you walk into a bank and, you know, comment on the guy's, you know, the bank teller's hair looking nice or something. Okay, that's a bit of a, a stupid example. You wouldn't do that today. But um, but it's a good book uh, and, and it's really good for both. There's, a, there's some chapters on sales, but there's also, there's also chapters on dealing with employees, um, dealing with, you know, just other people in your, your everyday life. I feel like most people today maybe aren't that great at communication and certainly in the SaaS world where there's a lot of people that are good at building things, maybe not so great at talking to people. If you learn how to talk to people effectively, you will stand out um, and, and personal branding, personal you know, people liking you and wanting to do business with you is, is a massive competitive advantage today. You know, you're probably not going to get that from feature parity. You're probably not going to get that from, you know, the tech that you're building. You're more likely to get it from, hey, this person just really liked me and wanted to do business with me. So um, how to win friends and influence people is, is another good one. A um, couple of other ones on copywriting, particularly conversion-focused copywriting, persuading people to take action with words. Uh, there's a book called Cashvertising that I would recommend. That's, that's really good. Um, I think Dan Kennedy has a bunch of other really good stuff about that to uh that was so that was that was a recommendation for my old business partner he he was he, he was a copywriter by trade um and he worshipped everything that dan kennedy wrote so uh check that out um and in terms of marketing in general the the two that i tend to recommend the most are um russell brunson stuff so marketing secret sorry dot com secrets and expert secrets um check out those books i think you can buy it. I think you can find a free PDF floating around somewhere. Um, but they're both they're both really good. It, it's very Russell Brunson, very used car salesman e. Um, but the the guy is really smart. And he knows what he's talking about. So if you can kind of put aside the sort of greasy sales tactics a little bit, and there, there's a lot of gold in there as well. If you sort of brush away the the grease stains um, and, and 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 see what's underneath. But there's some really excellent stuff in dot com secrets and expert secrets as well. So check them both out. Awesome. And then just to add the the um, other website that you mentioned about the co founder equity qual mm. uh, co founder equity calculator is founders dot com. But that's founders without the e. So it's f o u n d r s dot com. Ryan, listen. Thanks so much. This was this was a what is it, a treasure a treasure trove of information so thanks so much thanks for letting me have you on your show <laughs> thank you for for flipping the script this is this is fun being in the other side of of, of the interview this time around thanks yeah this was an interesting one thanks ryan <laughs>